So <clears throat> now we have pretty much covered actually everything else except the statistical part of, of things. Uh, we already also looked at the uh, genome browser visualization. <clears throat> so now the only topic really we have left is, is this one. And uh, yes, yeah, so the whole point is that we have uh, groups, experimental groups, and we want to figure out which genes differ in the level of expression between those groups. Um, now, there are some things that one needs to remember. And if you don't remember anything else from this course uh, afterwards, the only one thing I force you to remember is that it is very, very important that you have biological replicate samples. So not just one sample per group, but several, at least three samples per each group. Um, now then, uh, the other things uh, you will notice um, one considers here is that, well, the, the counts that we have for each uh, gene in each sample, they need to be normalized because it could be that the library size is different for different samples, meaning that the total number of reads is different. Um, and then there is an also another thing called RNA composition bias, which I will explain. Uh, and, and one very important thing to remember also is that, uh, so always the numbers that you feed to these statistical tests they need to be raw counts, meaning exactly the kind of counts you, you were obtaining from HTSeq. So we didn't uh, fiddle with them in any way. Uh, there are some um, uh, transformations like the FPKM transformation, and, and that this is something you cannot use those values in this context. And finally, since we are doing actually lots and lots of tests, because each gene is actually a separate test, uh, we have a multiple testing problem that we need to correct for. So, so these are the things I will be discussing. Um, and the tools that we use today are uh, HR and DESIC2, but there are also others. Um, DEXSIC is for exon level differences. Uh, CAFDIF and VOLCOUNT can look at transcript level differences, and so forth. Um, there are a lot of comparison articles also. So independent people have compared these methods. And here I have a couple of, of comments from these comparisons. So for example, they say that, well, um, those tools that are based on this so-called negative binomial modeling seemed to do pretty well. Um, and then it was interesting that a tool that has been used a lot, uh, especially in the past, CAFDIF, that actually didn't perform uh, that well. So now we will go through these different steps. Uh, so you, you, don't, uh, you don't have to run separate tools for these different steps. The one tool does it all for you, but, but like DSEQ2 does it all. But you, you still need to understand what is happening uh, when it's running. So let's discuss the normalization first. And um, so uh, we can, or one might want to normalize for, for different situations. Our situation is that we want to compare expression between groups of samples. So like I said, we need to take into account the total number of reads from each sample. And then we have this composition effect as well, uh, which I try to illustrate uh, with, with my great drawings here. So let's say that we have two cell types, the round one and the square one. And we want to compare the expression level of genes. Now, these cells are super simple. They are expressing only three different genes, uh, red, blue, and black in both. 
But as you can see, the round one actually expresses lots of black gene, uh, whereas the levels of the others, other genes are the same. So um, now you could think about uh, sequencing as a sort of random sampling approach, um, meaning that uh, you could think of these cells as, as two backs, really, and you could blindfold your eyes, and you would be allowed to take, um, let's say, three sticks from both of these backs uh, without seeing which color you take. Just randomly, you take three from the round, round one and from the square one. And then you are allowed to open your eyes and look what colors did you get. So the chances are that you would actually probably get more black um, from here than from here. Uh, and as you were allowed to take only three, then if you got more black, then you probably wouldn't get as much blue or, or red uh, than you would get from here. So then if you would look at uh, your, the, the amount of, say, blue, blue uh, sticks, uh, you would say that, oh, I got less blue sticks from this back or, or this cell than from this one. So, so that must mean that the blue gene is downregulated here if compared to, the, to this square cell type. But actually, that is not true. As you can see, they express the same level of the blue. But uh, what happened is that uh, because there is so much black here, that is sort of overpowering the situation. And, and then you falsely start to call the blue one uh, downregulated or underexpressed, which is not. So, so this is the composition effect. So if there is someone, some gene that is super highly expressed, that can distort uh, what you get out of the sequencing then. So we need to correct for this as well. And, and these are the things that we correct for in, in this scenario when we compare groups of samples. If you just wanted to compare one gene to another gene, uh, say in one sample, then um, then you would be correcting for different things, such as transcript length and GC content. And uh, again, there are comparison articles, and uh, they, the, the, the bottom line was that, well, this DSIG2 and HR are doing quite a good job in normalization. Uh, there are other methods, like the FPKM method, which which uh, should be avoided, actually. And so why should it be avoided? Because you often see this in articles. They talk about RPKMs or FPKMs, uh, which are actually pretty much the same thing, except that FPKM is for paired entry and RPKM is single entry. So what it stands for is reads or, or fragments per kilopase per million mapped reads. So in other words, it, it takes the count value and then it transforms it um, uh, according to this, this formula here. So I have an example. Uh, we have two different transcripts. One is uh, 20K long, has 400 counts. The other one is half a K long and has 10 counts. And in both cases, the total amount of counts in that sample is, is 20 million. So we plug in the numbers to the formula. And in both cases, our end result is 1. Now, the problem is that if we would now go and, and use, uh, use this number 1 in our differential expression analysis, uh, we wouldn't know anymore um, how high level was the original count. And it is actually important to know that because 400 is, is a big number. So it is hard to get 400 reads just by chance, whereas 10 is a small number and there could be more sort of noise in the low range. So we lose that information if we do the transformation.
and, and that's why you cannot use FPKMs or RPKMs uh, when you are doing differential expression analysis, but you need those original counts. So in this case, the 400 and the 10. Um, and then let's let's see how then HR and D seek to normalize things. So some of you might have been doing microarray analysis before. And, and there you know that when we do normalization, we actually force the distributions to be identical. But here we don't. So here um, we, we just want to make sure that, well, the non-differentially expressed genes get um, more or less similar level uh, counts. This also makes a couple of assumptions. It assumes that most of the genes don't change, that only minority changes. And those that do change go sort of more or less equally up and down. So this, of course, might not be the case if you have a very specific uh, experiment. And finally, they don't actually output the normalized data, but they just calculate this normalization factors um, when they do the testing. Uh, we don't need to go in details here at all. We can just look at the DSEQ2. Uh, so the way how the normalization happens, it takes the geometric mean of genes counts across all the samples. And then it divides counts in each sample by that geometric mean. So you get a lot of ratios for each gene. Uh, in each sample, you get a ratio. And then within one sample, you take all those ratios, take the median value of them, and that's your normalization factor for the uh, gene, genes count uh, in that sample. So essentially, you make like a reference sample, which is the geometric means, and then you divide by that. Um, then another thing, which is also pretty central to this kind of stuff, is called uh, dispersion estimation. And it, it might be a bit confusing, but what is this dispersion now? This is a new uh, word. But essentially, it, it relates to the, to the variability uh, of, of the expression values uh, within group or between replicates. And of course, this is very important information because when we are comparing expression levels between groups, we also need to know how noisy those groups are. So we need to calculate this dispersion. And uh, here you have the formula. So you, we take the uh, coefficient of variation uh, for a gene, and, and then you put that to the power of, of 2. So for example, if this expression differs from replicate to replicate by 20%. Uh, then you put that to the power of 2, so you get 0.04. And that is your dispersion value for that gene. But then we have a big problem, because to do this reliably, we would need lots of replicates, and sequencing is expensive. So we don't usually afford to run lots and lots of replicates, like say 50. I mean, who affords to do 50 replicates? Not many. So uh, people have come up uh, with a cunning idea that, well, maybe we can borrow information. So when we are estimating this um, uh, within group variability for one gene, uh, and we only have, say, three replicates, then we look well, are there other genes that are expressed at the similar level? And what is they within group variability? And then we kind of pool all that information and just assume that if a gene is expressed at similar level to another gene, then they probably have a similar dispersion. So that is illustrated in this uh, graph here, which is called the dispersion plot. and in this plot, so what you have on x-axis here is essentially the expression level, so uh, number of counts. 
and what you have in the y-axis is the variability. And you can see that, and, and each dot is a gene. So you can see that, well, uh, if you have a gene which is a low expression, so it would be in this end of the graph here, then the variability is quite high. But when, whereas if you look at genes which have a lot of counts, then the variability is lower or the dispersion is lower. In, in other words, there is a lot of noise in this low count end. And, and that's a bit of a problem. So, so these are, are very noisy and hence not so reliable. Meaning that, well, it's, it's quite easy to just by chance to get, say, two reads instead of four. And it's immediately like a, you know, like a hundredfold increase. So what we do or what DSIC2 does is that, well, it looks at this black cloud of, of dots first. And then it fits a line, which is the red line here. And, and, and so it is essentially this red line kind of um, considers all the points at each, each expression level and gives you advice that, well, you know, it, it might be around here. And, and, and this is now the borrowing idea then. So, so then what you do is then you pull the, each gene towards this line. So each black dot is pulled towards the red line and the new location is marked blue. So you can see that the genes move towards the line. So the blue cloud is much tighter. And these are the final uh, dispersion values for each gene, uh, which will be used then in the calculation. Uh, in addition, up here, uh, you can see some blue dots, which are much fatter. Uh, these are the ones uh, where the dispersion values are so far off from the line that <clears throat> they are not pulled down anymore, uh, because that would give you false positives if you would artificially make them have smaller dispersion than what they really have. Um, And, and then when, when the, all this is done, so the normalization and this dispersion estimation, then the tool actually proceeds to the actual statistical testing. And there they typically use uh, a thing called a generalized linear model. The idea being that um, we think about the, uh, the expression of a gene uh, as a sum of, of various things. So uh, we have some sort of starting point, uh, like a reference point for the expression, and then various things add to that expression level. So for example, to which group does the uh, um, um, does it belong? So is it a control group or cancer group? The cancer might have some effect. Also, if it was a time cause, the time point might have some effect. Uh, if it comes from a particular individual, that might affect the expression of a certain gene as well. So, so we just think about the expression level as some of, of these factors that we have in our experiment. And uh, so, and, and this would be linear model. Now, the reason why we call it generalized linear model is that these expression values are not distributed normally, but they follow or are thought to follow this so-called uh, negative binomial distribution. And, um, and then for the actual tests, um, well, HR and DSIG2 are, are quite similar, so both of them are based on this uh, negative uh, um, binomial modeling and this generalized linear models. Uh, the actual test is slightly different, so here it's a likelihood ratio test, whereas uh, in the case of DSIG2, it's the Walt test. Uh, but then, so today we will actually be focusing on DSEQ2, especially because it has some extra features which are quite handy. 
and and one of them is that um, it shrinks uh, log fold changes to zero um, when the counts are are low. So I will show that in this picture. It's easier to understand. So this plot is uh, called MA plot, but what you have here again x-axis is the expression level. So low expressors are at this end and high expressors are here. And then you have log fold change on, on, on this axis here. So uh, if you have a big positive fold change, that would be up here. And if the change has a big uh, negative fold change, it would be down here. So now, uh, when I said that DSIG2 uh, shrinks uh, the fault changes, it, it actually does this. So it, it looks at this end, the low expressors, and it says, well, yeah, surely it looks like there are big fault changes, but actually I don't trust it because that can be just noise because it's so easy just by chance to have five counts instead of 10 and so forth. So I will shrink this part towards zero and I'm not going to get carried away by these things. So that is quite good for us. Um, right, and, and then final thing uh, I still need to mention. So because we run thousands of tests, uh, for each gene there is a test. Um, it, uh, it, it's very possible that just by chance we get good p-values. Uh, when there's actually no difference, we still get a good p-value. So we, that would give us false positives, which we don't want. And hence we need to correct for this multiple testing uh, situation. So there are various ways to do it, but uh, the most common one is the benjamin hofberry correction where essentially you multiply every p-value by a number and uh, the number depends on <clears throat> on the ranking of the, the gene. So the gene with the best p-value, which is the smallest p-value, you actually multiply the p-value by the number of genes you had um, in your experiment. So if the number was 30,000, you go and multiply your p-value of that best gene by 30,000, which then means that, well, the p-value might not be so good anymore. So you, you get reliable stuff, but, but then your p-values are not good. And this is annoying because we want to get good p-values. Um, so we have found ways around that. And, and by, by the way, so these corrected p-values are called uh, adjusted uh, p-values uh, or FDRs. So how do we uh, tweak the system so that this multiple testing correction is not so harsh? Well, what we can do is, because it depends on the number of genes in the test, we can make the number of genes smaller, so we can let test less genes. But then we need to decide, uh, well, which genes are we going to kick out from the testing? And so typically, we want to kick out genes which are not expressed in any sample, well, they are not going to be differentially expressed then either. So those are safe to leave out. But then we also want to leave out genes which are expressed at very low level. Because remember, those low counts are not reliable. However, when we do this, we need to decide what is the threshold. Where do we draw the line? Uh, what, how many reads is, is low level? And um, uh, the nice feature with DSEQ2 is that it actually figures out that level for you automatically. So it kind of tries to optimize it so that you get still the maximum number of, of differentially expressed genes. And, and then <clears throat> when you run these tools, you get uh, result files with several columns. So if you look at the columns here, so first I have my identifiers. 
They look a bit strange now. These are fly-based identifiers, not ensemble, but fly-based. And but but after that, everything is uh, uh, related then to this test. So the most important column you want to look at is the p-adjusted column. So this is the p-value adjusted uh, for multiple testing. This is the original p-value. So you can see that it, it, it does get worse. If, if you look at the power here, that, that definitely changes. Uh, the other columns you might be interested in is, is the log two fold change column. And, and pay attention, it is really log two fold change. So not linear fold change, but log two, meaning that if it would say um, two, for example, here, it would actually mean fourfold uh, difference. So, so that was pretty much it um, for differential expression. Um, and at this point, uh, you are free to free to well ask questions or, or go to the exercises. So now. Um, you can actually do all the remaining exercises, so from uh, exercise 3 to exercise 10.